Welcome to the Comedy's Best Kept Secret Tour. I'm Dan Frigolet, your host. I'm here with Emilio Tobias. Good evening. In South Africa. It's like my last hour in South Africa. <laughs> Thank you for uh, coming on the podcast. Thank you for saving my, actually, in my entire day. Um, I've had a, 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 a uh, tumultuous uh, 72 hours. Uh, on behalf of uh, the comedians of South Africa. <laughs> 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 we wanted to give you a nice send off. Yes, no, that that's been the thing so far. Is yeah, everybody wants me to leave with like a like a good sentiment of what this was. I think also everybody thinks that um they can just come to my house in the U.S. whenever they want. Yeah. Now. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's we're gonna we must make a schedule because we, <laughs> we have a time show and dance. So, house. so that's the thing I must reconcile <laughs> because yeah, everybody's like, hey, I'm just gonna come, and it's people that I, and this is my favorite part. It's people that I haven't met very much. Like I met uh, one of the, like one of the hosts of Trending SA. I met her for fifteen or sixteen seconds, and she was like, oh, "I'm coming to your house in the uh, in the U.S. when you come in New one? York." Which one? Um, Bobby. The, is yeah, she the one who really doesn't have much of? She's her hair's down. She has long hair. Oh no, that's uh, Cooley Roberts. Yeah, 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 yeah. She's a lunatic. She's very fun. Yeah. But I met her for five minutes. She's like, "Yeah, yeah, darling, I'm coming to your home." That's very funny. She is I can't do the accent. Uh, I've right. sort of figured out as I can't as I can't do the accent uh, here. Um, so yeah, so you have been, uh, somehow you've been at every show I think that I've been at and I did and, and all, none of those shows that I know you would have been at. So you're like a big part of this community. Except Parker's like, I don't know if I'm like a big part of the community because I'm still like one of the young guys. Yeah. So I guess as a whole, all of us as they are, you probably saw me more cause it's January. There's very few gigs around now. So. So this is your time. It's my time to push, and yeah. if I don't do it now, I might not have the stamina for the rest of the year. Right, because it's because it's gonna get hard. The competition is gonna be more. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't understand that about the culture here. Was that you guys take all of December off, and then because of that, almost all of January becomes off. We don't we don't do that anywhere else. I guess it's because like our oh, holidays are structured differently. You guys have summer. Yeah. In in June, July, or whatever. Yeah. Our schools close for December and half of January. Yeah. So most but people go away. That has nothing to do with Christmas or it does? I think our holidays are set up like that because of Christmas. Okay. Yeah. What and that's what, what I thought. How long do you guys take off? Well, they do. Well, we have, we have similar. So we have. So for schools, schools would close the week before Christmas and then come back maybe a week after New Year's. So it's, what's that, two weeks? Two weeks, yeah. Yeah. yeah like um, like but then they get the whole summer off. Yeah, summers are three months. Yeah, do you not get that at all? Nah. So this then is the so this is the summer break. Yeah, this is our summer break because it's is summer year now. Ten weeks or eight weeks, six weeks. Six to eight weeks. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So, so that makes that sense. Most people are out of town, and we don't have sixty comedy gigs. We have yeah. We have about ten. So yeah, everybody was telling me uh, don't come in January, and I was like, I have no choice. I already I'm coming. Yeah. So f- just deal with it. But you, you coped, you survived, you did something. It worked out. It worked out. But I, I did miss out on some some pretty, what sounds like fantastic rooms. Um, but all that happened was it gave me a hunger to come back. Yeah. Um, and I, I just appreciate, I don't know, it, it's a community. I mean, in the community, I guess also it helped a lot that everybody was open arms. They waited till they saw me do comedy. Isn't it? Maybe then Which they is didn't interesting. Come on too strong yeah, you well, you don't want to, you don't want to like give that guy credibility if he hasn't earned it. A li- like a little bit, bro. Like, not saying nothing about your comedy, but South Africans love foreigners from overseas. Yeah, we don't, we don't like our, uh, like foreigners from other African countries. Right, like right. Yeah, we like Americans. We like Europeans. I don't it know is interesting. I, that, that's yeah. what we were talking about this in the car about how. Um, wh- so what happened was, so when you come here, well, here's what I did. I went on the CDC website. I said I'm going to South Africa. I don't know anything about other countries. Should I get a vaccine? Should I do some things? And they said you should get a, you should get hepatitis A. You should get typhoid, and you should get malaria pills. So I said okay, I'm going to go do those things. Went and saw my doctor. They went to the same CDC site that I went to, and they were telling me the information that I just... I walked in, I said, I need to get malaria pills, I need to get typhoid, I need to get hepatitis A. And he goes on the computer in front of me, and I, I put it all on my Snapchat story. And he does exactly that. And he, he reads it from the website, and he goes, so we're going to give you malaria pills, typhoid, and hepatitis A. And I was like... And so rather than argue with him, I go, oh, great. You know? Um, but so then when I was here and I got sick, 
And um, well, the other thing is everybody, everybody, nobody wants me to go home and be like, I went to South Africa and I got sick. Don't yeah. go there. Um, but uh, everybody, I was like talking about malaria and they're like, there's no malaria in this country. And then I started researching and there is malaria in this country. And it's in, you know, it's whatever. It's fine. It's in Limpopo or whatever. But the people come to the hospital here. But then still everybody here is like, no, 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 no. Those people are from Zimbabwe. They're from Tanzania. They're bringing well, it from they other places. Recently got here. They, yes. They got, they got bitten by a mosquito two days ago. When and, then br- and then brought it in. Yeah, I like, I like that idea. So, like, that's, that's sort of like another, it's another racism. Like, you guys, like, you guys are kind of like, like, Everything's cool in South Africa until you, people are coming from Zimbabwe. I'm gonna sound like a ra- like how racist people defend their racism. <laughs> okay, this is gonna be great. It's not racism. It's like geographically impossible. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's geographically impossible for you to get malaria in Johannesburg. Okay, um, but then, like I said, it is it is a racism because the view that Americans have of Africa, yeah, is the view that South Africans have. Of the rest of Africa. Yeah, that's interesting. So, like, I was, I said on Facebook the other day. No one liked it because I don't know. I said on Facebook, the reason why South Africans were offended by uh, Trump's shithole yeah. statements is because when America looks at Africa, we in the same boat. Yeah, yeah. And we're offended because now... How dare you uh, compare us to Togo or then, Ghana or... And then what, what's the use of you showing us pictures of Cape Town or you showing us pictures of like high buildings in Johannesburg? Yeah. The rest of South Africa, shadow is a disrespectful term. Yeah. But this is not the time for us to like show that South Africa is better than what you think it is. Yeah. But rather we'll say there's also like shit parts in America also. Yeah, maybe that's like the... Like yeah. states yeah. in yeah. America. Yeah. Well, what was interesting about that whole thing was that he called Africa a country. He said shithole countries. He said uh, El Salvador, Haiti. Uh, Haiti, and Africa, the country, which is crazy. Wow. And that was the thing that you guys didn't pick up on, which I thought was interesting. Because I, in, I was in the trending SA room when they were talking about it, and, they, and I was like, guys, Africa's not a country. Let's start there. Because that's the first thing Americans pointed out, was that, it was that it's a continent, don't be an idiot, whatever, whatever. Yeah. But even you guys are like, no, 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 it's, just, it's not a shithole. That's the part that you're like, no, 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 it's not a shithole. Like, no, it's not a country. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I get it. I get it. I mean, it, th- as an American, we can't understand really what it is to uh, hate on another country that might be our neighbor. Like, because we, we do it with our states. Yeah. We'll say, look, everything's fine as long as you're not from West Virginia. We, sh- we do shit like that, you know? <laughs> um, but we're still acknowledging that they're part of the whole. You know, and we, I guess we shit on Canada, we shit on Mexico here and there. But, yeah, we, we can't really understand the, the conversation of being on a continent where your neighbors are, are completely different countries with completely different yeah. leadership. And, and sometimes it's archaic. And sometimes it's, it's still in progress. Yeah, it's rough, man. But America, like, shits on everyone. Yeah, that's our, that's Even what we're good at. Mexico and Canada. Even each other, bro. That's what we're yeah. good at. That's what we're the best at. It's tough. It's a tough time. It's a tough time to be a comedian, and that's why South Africa, I think, is 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 crucial right now because you guys are, um, you guys are like, I don't know, you you not that you're, not that you have less scrutiny, but, um, but things are happening here, and people are not. It's so new that people are not in the position where they're in the United States where they've taken it for granted. They've taken a gra- comedy for granted now and decided to start telling comedians what they can and can't talk about. Um, there is a thing like, and probably that's like, like the conservative thing where people are telling like, how can you say that it's offensive? Telling comedians like, yeah. what's offensive? Right. Like, don't say that. South Africa is a very like conservative country. And that's probably something that is like slowed down the growth yeah. of stand up comedy. Well, that's the beginning. So it's it's like a the beginning is you can't say this, you can't say this, and comedian goes, I can say this, I can say this, I can say this. But so now in the United States, we've hit the other end of the we've other hit the other end of the wall, coming, which coming is coming back around. Now. Yeah, which is they're going well. You could say this for twenty years, and you can't say this now again. But like, yeah, I guess like I don't know why I stand up because on the other end, I'm thinking like. A lot of comedians probably a few years ago it was you become a big comedian just for making jokes about 
white people do this and yeah. black people do yeah. this. And that's your whole joke. Yeah. Black people do this, white people do this. Same so in like the US. Someone asked me yesterday, so we're talking about race and there's, there's like a family thing and the one la- older lady asked me like, so can you say those stuff on stage? Yeah. Then I was like, you can't go on stage and actually be racist. Yeah. You can speak about like, black people are going through this, white people are going yeah. through this. And you can make you can make jokes about those things, but you can't actually be racist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a difference in yeah, people on for stage. Sure. Can tell. So there is a thing of like, don't, 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 don't be racist on stage. And just because people laughed, yeah, like you think that's comedy. Yeah. No, that's yeah, that's that's a good that's a good way to put it. Um. So I don't know where I stand. For a second, I thought I was disagreeing with you, but yeah, no. Um, but so I well, so I'm telling you as an outsider, it, it's it's fantastic. Your comedy here is fantastic, yeah. and and it has, but and it has reached a, a certain level where people are starting to get famous now, which and it's exactly what I thought. I was telling everybody before I got here that I th- that it feels like I'm going to New York in the 1980s because this is the energy yeah. that you have here, and it is because since I've been here, Luisa Matinga uh, has become famous since I got here. Matinga, yeah. What am I saying? You said Matinga. L- Luisa Matinga. Yeah. Uh, has gotten famous. Of course, I fucked up his name. Uh, <laughs> and um, and he's brilliant, and he's quick, and he's like so, and he's so the guy that should totally have the thing, because uh, I've worked with him, and he's he's incredible. Yeah. Um, and he's working so hard. Um, but like on that, like that's my thing. Like, it's not that he wasn't capable of of being like a big star or yeah. correspondent for the Daily Show, but like everything you do up until the announcement. Yeah. Is like preparation. Yeah. So now, this guy's been doing comedy for a while. I'm starting. I'm learning things now that he probably learned years ago yeah. in the beginning. Well, of and, his he, comedy and I guess and and he's and this thing that he got has been in progress for like eight months. Yeah. So he's known for eight months. And that he's the guy. Had, I had no idea. And he couldn't. Well, he also like he couldn't tell anybody. And I and this actually I found this out. I found this out uh, on the set of the Stuart Taylor show. Was some people knew and they were saying it to each other like you know. Uh, he got the thing and people were like, nah. And it wasn't yeah. until like some reporter reported it that it was like real news. And then it became like viral that day. The funny thing is because go Trivia South African and the thing like we're like we're this thing where our friends must like, yeah. put us in and whatever. And like I would ask the guys like seeing that Trevor was like the African correspondent. Yeah. It would mean one of you guys will be the next one. Right. And I asked, like, wh- do, who do you think it'll be? What it will be? Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm asking this question in the head, they're thinking, he doesn't even know. Yeah, 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 he yeah. He doesn't yeah. even know. Yeah. And then when it comes, I was like, I knew it. Ah, that's funny. I knew it. Yeah, that's funny. Well, so there was a guy. Who was the guy before? So you said Trevor was, was that for the show? Trevor was most African. I'm saying most, with that means, like, isn't it? Trevor was African correspondent when oh. John Stewart was. Okay, I didn't realize that. I didn't. I wasn't. I didn't follow it as, as heavily as I should have. And then Trevor came, and then there was another. There was a guy here. There was one guy before. No, there wasn't. I'd like, now that Trevor is hosting the show. No, they told me there was a guy before Luisa. That did what? That was that was that job, and then he left. So that I don't know that. Yeah. Story. Oh, okay. All right. Why would he? That's weird. Though. Why would he leave? Though. I don't know. Well, or maybe he was fired. You don't know, you don't know why anybody leaves what they do, especially if it's good. But maybe it was Trevor that they were talking about. No, right? no, it was a different guy. It was since Trevor. I'm sure of it. They, as far as there was never a South African on, no, that's what on they were the Daily me. Show. We're gonna have to Google it after this. So maybe he was in. He was. He was Trevor was talking to him and asking him to do the show, and he pulled out before it got announced, but. You know, we're going to Google this after the show. There was a guy. There was a guy who had the job for a second, and then they were like, who's next? And this is who's next, is Luis, M- Luis Medina. Anyway, but so, but it just speaks to, I don't know, the fact that it, I mean, it is. It's becoming, it's becoming more and more possible to, I don't know, have, have the thing. And, um, and, and, um, and, and a sad part of me thinks it's, it would be easier for me to make it here than in New York because of, you know, the just, it's too many. It's too many comedians, too many. Like I was saying, like, I was saying to you earlier, um, if you take, like, myself who's been in comedy for two years. Yeah. And a guy from Cape Town who's been in comedy for two years. Yeah. I'm getting paid in Cape Town. Yeah. Way before the guy in Cape Town. Yeah. But he's getting paid in Johannesburg. 
before I am getting right. paid in Johannesburg. Well, so I come to I come to South Africa with 12 years of experience. Nobody's ever seen me. I walk on stage as a 12 year comedian, yeah. and it shows. True. But when I get to the U.S., I get on stage, and I'm just the guy who's been around for 12 years. Because there's so many other. Well, and they also what happens is they get to see you from the start. Oh, okay, cool. So 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 it's like they they first, don't they, they might not even first impressions. They might not even watch me. Because they, they remember what I did six years ago. And what I did six years ago, I wouldn't want to show somebody. Nor yeah. would I want somebody remembering, you know? Um, and so, you know, just like, that's just, that's just the arc of this art form is you get better every year. You get better every year, you quit. You, you get better every year, you'll quit. You get better every year or you quit. That's the, oh. Those are the two choices. Yeah. You, ca- you can't keep getting stage time and be worse it, at this thing. You'll be surprised. You can st- <laughs> you can stay relatively the same. Here's the thing, because and, and well, that's the phenomenon, right? So there's a guy who's there's 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 plenty of guys that have been doing it ten years, haven't done a new joke in in four years. Those jokes were okay four years ago, uh, but now they're strong because they've worked the jokes. So they've they've worked out all the all the all the poison. Yeah. You know, they've they've worked all the all the crap out of them. Um, the that joke I've still isn't good, mm-hmm. but you can deliver it to an audience and have them have fun. Like that happened with me, like. My first year, at the end of my first year, I was like, okay, cool. I found, like, my five minutes, it works. Yeah. Whatever. And it's, like, the five minutes. I've probably written hours of material that I'll never do again. Right, right. Because it's just not that funny. Or You'd be surprised. There's some stuff that you tackle in your first three years that, that you, can't, you can't figure out. But it's yeah. in the back of your mind. Yeah. And you don't know why you couldn't figure it out. Yeah. And then year seven, you're working on a new bit, and you're like, oh, shit, that thing that I'll I said back that then... Thing, yeah. Now I can get it to work because yeah. it's a component of something bigger or vice versa. So uh, I was getting I was getting tired of this five minutes of mine. Yeah. So for a month, it was also a January, I think a January in 2016. I was like, okay, cool. Let me try new jokes. I did new jokes for two months. I was like, no, I need to go back to my go five back to minutes. Go stuff that works. Because you learn so much from, from fixing and working that five minutes. Yeah. So I did that for another year. Yeah. Then... I did like, I wrote like 15 new minutes just based on stuff that happened in the news or whatever. Yeah. And that propelled me. I don't know. Last year was a big year for me. Yeah. Just from the new 15 minutes and the no stuff shit. I learned from the five. Yeah. Yeah. And then like you said, there's a joke that I used to do in my first three months. Yeah. I brought that back. I worked it. I worked it. Yeah. I did a, a comedy tour. So we did Cape Town, Durban and Johannesburg. Nice. By the time I was done with the tour, that joke was perfect yeah the what you what you can learn by just saying this is my material for this chunk of time and sticking to that is huge and you can and you can really figure out what that joke is uh in 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 that period of time yeah um i had that goal i had that goal this last december there was a couple jokes i really wanted to get perfect and day one of the tour i found out that uh, Comedy Central was looking for 30 minute videos and I had just left my house and I was now a thousand miles away and I did, so all the videos that I have that are 30 minutes that I would love to submit I don't have access to wow. so my choices were go back so you had to re-record your 30 minutes or yeah or basically do the 30 minutes that I'm ready to, to do and then it was and I was like and, I, and because the tour was like uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try some new stuff and I don't really care and I got some days off and I'm gonna get this stuff figured out it was like a more relaxed version of the tour than he, usually I'll do a tour and I'll do a show every night yeah uh, or at least the equivalent of every night if I, if I miss a Monday we'll do two Saturdays and this one was like uh, I'll do five shows this week maybe three shows next week not a big deal you know it was like it was christmas it was it was relaxing and then it became like i have all these not perfect shows and now i have to tape 30 minutes and so i had to tape five of them before i had the one that i could send back yeah and it you was, finally found it yeah but it, but then again it's it's the same it's the same 30 that i that i have on a tape it, with a packed out show from six months before that so it's just kind of depressing so then i didn't really get to work on 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 the joke that i wanted to work on but i got it i got it ready right around christmas and right at the new year's and i brought it here which was pretty much it was the alzheimer's joke that i wanted to work on which for me is important because my grandfather died this week of alzheimer's yeah um and i wanted it to be right for my family really yeah and it's not that i'm going to tell it at his funeral but i wanted to tell it on stage Sort of as a as a memory to him. Um, Do you feel like 
Okay, sorry for the play on words. No, please. You had a deadline to finish. This that's show. funny. <laughs> uh, that's exactly how I felt. It became it became clear that uh, his his health was rapidly deteriorating. And I said, if I'm going to be serious about this joke, because I, I thought of the joke like last March, and yeah. I was like, if I'm going to be serious with this joke. I got to get this thing. I got to get this thing figured out today. It's like because there was a part of the joke, the idea of the joke worked, you know, at open mics in the beginning, but it was too harsh for a crowd. Yeah. So then I had to build. I had to build this sort of padding on it. So I have to sort of like deconstruct marriage first before I talk about Alzheimer's and how that relates to my parent, my grandparents' marriage, and then and then I had to pad it on the other end because it's like it's it's one thing to say this thing about Alzheimer's and I'm not going to do the joke for the, for the, for the camera, but yeah. uh, it's, it's one thing to say this thing about Alzheimer's that I find funny, but then I also have to like support it. So I had to come up with the supporting evidence that was similar and why I'm saying this thing. And then I got to that point and all the stuff was funny. So then, and then the last thing that I said wasn't hitting and I couldn't figure out why. And it was because I was, it was a different joke. I was saying a different joke to end it. And then yeah. once I reconciled that and I reconciled like, that here, in South Africa, and once I figured out that that was a different joke, then I then I just have to build in the setup for that different joke right before, in in the other padding, yeah. and then I can say it. So now the beginning all the way through the end gets the laugh where I want it to get the laugh, and so it's it's right it's right now. Um, I I ask you now about that. My, I came to Madinga, ne? the same Madinga we're talking about. Yeah, I said to like at the end of this joke. I know what it's supposed to feel like to me. Yeah. And I know what it's supposed to feel like to the crowd. Yeah. And he told me, like, the thing about the ch the joke is, it's very delusional. Yeah. Like, it's me being delusional about my relationship with someone. Yeah. That's what the whole joke yeah. is. Yeah. But at the end, for some reason, I say something that's, like, solid enough to realize that I'm not actually delusional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I break, like, the... Like, you know, you create a world. Yeah. You so create a world and then, like, you disobey the rules of that. Yeah. Place. I talked about this with another guy, Adam Gable. We were on the road almost all of last year. And, and his, the premise of his laughs for every laugh is I will say something very true as a setup. And then I will say something so untrue that it's funny yeah. as a punchline. And so that's the structure of all of his bits. And so the crowd gets used to that. Right. And then he has a joke where the punchline was true. And he couldn't figure out why this joke wasn't working. And I was like, it's not working because it's not you. It's yeah. not who you've just told the crowd you are. Yeah. So we're expecting you to say the most untrue thing. So then when you say the true thing, it doesn't fit within the formula you create. It's your formula. Yeah. So you have to maintain that line. True. Like, as soon as I realized that, I wrote, like, one line onto the joke. Yeah. And I was like, oh, cool, that works. Where you stay delusional. Where I, st where I stay delusional. Yeah. Because you don't have to tell them. Yeah. The crowd knows you're delusional. Yeah. But like, and then the thing was, I was I was searching for an ending. It never yeah. had an ending. Yeah, I hate I hate when that happens. It never had an ending. Yeah. And I used to take a shortcut to the ending. Yeah. By doing something like, you can clap for that, guys. Yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, like, yeah. You a never cheat. want to tell people what. Right, to do. a cheat. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what I want to ask you, if you didn't finish this joke before your grandfather died, yeah, do you think you would not have been able to, or it would have been harder for you to? Keep work it in those the set? things out after, after? He passed away. I think I could still work it out after he passed away, right? But uh, it's impure yeah, to me. You have to go back to see how you felt back then. It's not even that. It's it's just it's just that like because I did because I did set this thing. I set I set this sort of like self imposed uh, deadline mark to 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 finish it by. Mm. Then I would be admitted admitting failure. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's weird because it's like, it, it was happening right at the same time. It's like, because I sort of knew as soon as I, as soon as I landed, I got the news that like, he's probably not going to make it while you're, while you're out there. Uh, and, and you know, then I had to start figuring out whether or not I had enough time to go home, do all these things. And so, um, but it put that extra pressure that it was like, well, quit fucking around and finish the joke. Um, and the joke was done. I mean, the joke was was presentable in 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 rooms and clubs throughout the thing. But I I needed the final line um, because you need to go on a, out on a laugh. And so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. I think um, I think I would have kept chasing it because it's come far enough that it that it's it's worthy of being in my set uh, even even without the last lines. Yeah. So it had already come far enough. So then it just at that point the decision was gonna have to be cut the part that's not working. 
uh, and just end there or add something new. Or sometimes you look at a joke, it's not working, you have to turn it backwards. Because yeah. maybe maybe the setup was the... See, this is the thing. I went to journalism school, and I found I decided this a couple days ago, that journalism and comedy are in constant conflict. Because in journalism, you say all of the information at the beginning, and then at the bottom, there's nothing. You keep reading oh, to the yeah, bottom, yeah, you yeah. get nothing. But as a comedian, you want to hold the, one of the most crucial pieces of information till the bottom yeah. so that you can, you can use it to your advantage. So this idea that journalism... And comedy and constant conflict was just interesting from a writing perspective because I went to journalism school and that's where all my writing background started, right? So it's like you want to give all this information, and sometimes we do we make that mistake a lot. We hit a joke with a lot of information, and now we're just explaining a joke to a crowd as opposed to just telling the joke. But yeah. um, you know, well, I don't know. I was trying to write a bit like the the bit was, was would have been something like um, this is just like last like this week, and the bit would have been something like. Um, uh, Chicken tries to get to the other side. Okay. Right. Chicken crosses road to get to other side. And uh, ale- this, this chicken allegedly uh, crosses the road to get to the other side. Well, we don't know the answer. The, the chicken could not be found to comment. Now, it's not funny, but it's like that's, that, that shows the example. The end, of, the end of chicken crosses the road to get to the other side is to get to the other side. So you're starting a news article with the punchline. Yeah. Um, I have that issue. Like, you know that thing where, where you, the lists like. When we make lists of threes. Yeah. With, uh, yeah, I, I hate that structure. Why? I don't know. I don't like... I Because I decided to be a, a more of a storytelling uh, version of a comedian where the punchlines aren't as, aren't as broadcasted. I find that that's a broadcasted thing and it feels fake to me. So I, I wrote a bit on this trip that I can't do because it's got the, th- it's the threes. It's this idea that like as soon as you're about to go to somebody's house, they start telling you all of the lies they've been keeping from their family one minute before you meet their family. And it's like, that's a perfect, like, three. It's like, oh, it's, you know, just so you know, they don't know that I smoke. Just so you know, they don't know that I'm gay. Just so you know, they don't know that I've been living in New York City for five years. Yeah. And then you meet the family. But I, I just, I don't know. I, 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 don't, I don't like it, so I, I deliver it like I don't like it. And then the crowd goes, he doesn't even like this. Why should we like it? Like, that rule of, th- I, I get the rule of threes, no? and I had an issue, like, like the journalism thing where, Sometimes all your information is the beginning, and there's really no need to carry into the story. Yeah. But with comedy, you need to give them enough so that they keep the listening. Yeah. And throughout, for that big thing, that right? That that that, that the punchline is yours. Yeah. The end of the joke is for yeah. you. Yeah. But like people don't want to be bored the whole way. Right, right, right. So, you I think the punchline is for you? It's for me. It's not for them. It's for them. The more they enjoy it, the more I'll enjoy. Yeah. It. But like all the stuff in between. Yeah. Is what I work out for. Yeah. Like, my my joke is about being in traffic. And um, I like this girl in traffic and I phone her. And I, when, I, when I say this at the end of my joke, people are like, how did you phone her? Yeah. I phoned her because she had a for sale sign on a car window. Oh, that's great. It's very creepy. Yeah. But like, I was in traffic one day and I saw someone with a for sale sign. It wasn't a girl in the car or anything. Yeah. I just thought, like, wouldn't it be so creepy? It's a good inspiration, yeah. If I, f- if I phone someone. Yeah. Now I know that's what I want to say. Yeah. That's my whole joke. Okay, so, the, okay, so, so th- this, is, this is brilliant. This, okay, so this is, this is the interesting way. So this is, this is how I try to describe comedy to people a lot of times. Is, is it after a certain point in comedy, we see the thing. And we know that the thing is funny. Yeah. But now we have to figure out how to make it funny for you. You don't know that it's funny, right? Like, because you're so many steps ahead. Calling somebody on the thing, that's hilarious. But, you, but now you have, to fit, you have to make a scenario. For that to be. And you have to yeah. pad it on both ends so that it's enough of a thing that they, so they need to be then in traffic with you. Um, and and, that, and that, is, that is the success and failure of a comic is to get you to that in that seat to get to that point and f- have that instinct and that's our job is to make you there make you get right there yeah and sometimes we want to we want to we want to get you all the way to that point where we don't even have to say the thing or you think it right before we we make you think it right before we say it because you think it and you don't know it's true until we say it and then it's like we just picked it out of your brain yeah which is what good comedians can do so that that's why i feel like that last punchline or that that one punchline is for you yeah but yeah. like you don't want to bore anyone in between. So yeah, I guess I guess because this is the most heartfelt joke that I have, 
I feel exactly what you feel, which is when I say the last thing about my grandfather, and it, and it gets and it gets this laugh. It, it is. It's for me. It's for me, and it's for him. Yeah. Yeah. But you want them to. It's not like we're ignoring how you feeling about it. Yeah. But they don't know. But the, I, well, the only reason it's for you is because you know it's coming. Yeah. They don't know it's coming. And you want, like, we want people to feel what we feel. I think, like, don't you think, like, we we narcissistic in that way, like. Yeah, that, that I mean that's that is the narcissism of a comedian. Well, of all people, yeah, but of a comedian, we want to feel understood. Yeah. And then the problem is, eventually, we only feel understood on stage. Yeah. Or the most, the most understood on stage. I was telling someone like. Like pe- people are still asking me, like, how do you do it? Like, whatever. Then I'm like, believe it or not, I'm a shy person. Yeah. Believe it or not, this I'm is shy. like my one outlet. Like, speaking to one person, it's grueling. I can't handle it because, like, you're looking at each other. So much pressure. Like you're picking up on everything. Yeah. Each other. And like, this is one on one. This is one person on you. Yeah. This is all of the attention on you. Right. Instead of a group of a thousand people. Yeah. That's not a thousand people. I c- that's one. Yeah. Like that's one unit. Yeah. Of it's people. one organism. Yeah. I can't explain it to people why it's easier to talk to five hundred people than it is to talk to one. I can't explain it. It's a, but it's but it's true. It's just true. Um, yeah. That's that's the comedian problem, right? And ev- and that's the thing. Everybody thinks that comedians are supposed to be yeah like this and that and off stage. And there are guys yeah, who are clowns. Yeah, can do it. Yeah. Who are clowns off stage, right? We like to call them clowns if they if they if it's the same persona, you know. <laughs> but then there's and then there's guys who are very prolific comedians. You try to go up, go up to them after 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 they're up and on stage, then they and they're very skittish, you yeah. know. They put their hat back on and they like kind of run away. They put a jacket on, they cover up, they go away. They don't even want to hang out for the after show put thing. So, it is a weird thing because it is it's an outlet. And it, but it is but it is it's a selfish moment because, as a comedian, we get to say this is how it is. Yeah. Period. Whereas if you're in a conversation, like I've been in this before where I'm trying to um like light the fire of like what I think could be a joke and now it's a conversation and the first thing I say, which is hyperbole because I'm trying to get to the joke, the person goes, "Well, that's not true." Or oh, I feel different. Oh, now you're joking now. No, and no, then no. the joke and then the serious. joke yeah. and then the joke's gone. Because they because they don't agree to the premise. Because a conversation, you don't have to agree to the premise of it. But a joke, I have to make all you people agree to the premise. So there's a like there's a there's a there's a freedom and a selfishness to just being able to say whatever you want, and then and you put the mic away, and they don't get a say. And uh, and I guess that's why hecklers do that to us when they hickle. yeah. Because it's it's now a one on one conversation. Now. Well, they think it is right, and then also we become. We become more defensive because we go, no, you don't get a say. Yeah, like I'm getting there. Like, just hold on. Yeah, like, you you have talking. to agree to this premise yeah. because security will kick you out. Yeah, <laughs> that is what's fun. Security or insecurity will kick you out. Insecurity will kick you out. It's funny. So yeah, so uh, I don't know how. Did, so you said you started this. You actually told me this is this was just a kind of a timely thing, but you told me you actually did your first set at a funeral. So, a few weeks before my uncle died, I already like I always knew in high school that I'm one day I will do comedy. Yeah, but a few weeks before my uncle died was when I decided I'm doing it very soon. Yeah, I just need like the balls to do it. So, a day or two after the guy died. I told my family I want to say something at his funeral, and I really it was I really wanted yeah. to. It wasn't like I'm you know, I'm just using his funeral. Yeah, yeah. But you, I, you I s- <laughs> <laughs> like listen, guys. I've been trying to <laughs> to let you guys know I want to do comedy. Uh, like, this I is a perfect. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you wrote something and it became. It, it was not felt. It was but, funny. But the formula of it, the you know what I felt was a stand up scene. Yeah, I had a sit up. I spoke of something, and then. I had a punchline. Yeah. And because it was a funeral, there was no pressure of me to be funny. After right. every second thing that I said. Right, right. So I did something and I and I and I told people like, hey, this guy would wake me up and ask me if I'm doing anything. And then we decided to go to Krill. That's how I went to Krill of of Bank. Oh, really? He just woke me up in the morning. He said, Um, are you doing anything now? Yeah. He woke me up. Yeah. Are you busy? Um, I wanna let's go somewhere. Yeah, of course I'm not busy, I'm asleep. 
Yeah. So I told that story and I felt it was funny. Some people were like, nah, you know, it's cute. A yeah. Bit. So that was like, you know, like my first, like, you know, we, we do everything in just like, just like suicide. No one ever gets, s- kills themselves the first time. Oh, they just toe in? You put your toe in. Yeah. You d- so that's what I was doing. It's just a small cut to see if it hurts, see if you can handle the pain. Next week you try again. Yeah. Like until just, just choke yourself a little bit. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So that is interesting. Yeah. And then see, so then I'm in this position where I'm, I've been doing comedy 12 years and I feel like there might be strong feelings on you know in both directions whether or not people were like well we'll let him talk he'll be funny or we'll let him talk i hope he's not funny right so it's like and what's interesting is i wrote a thing people who book you or no 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 no. i'm like like my family like my family was asking me to speak oh at the funeral right so then my question is like do they think i'm gonna be funny or are they hoping i'm not gonna be funny And, and i feel like there's probably people in both camps you know yeah um because it's like it's it's not it's not a time you're supposed to be funny but as a comedian we know it is i mean every time is a time you could be funny but what's interesting is the day that i couldn't reach my family and and it, you know I'm, I'm eight hours different so i basically am waking up when everybody's asleep and I'm, I'm doing the first eight hours of my day while they're asleep so what happens is um and then on top of that i didn't have any wi-fi so there was just a period of time where i didn't i hadn't spoken to anybody and i had a feeling that today was the day. I don't know why I had the feeling, but I was right. And in that period, I was I was writing something else. I was actually writing something that was funny. And then I broke from it, just wrote two lines on my page and just wrote this thing that's not funny, but that uh, that I think summarizes his life and my feelings and, and how I'm and how I've been feeling for the last couple of months. Yeah. And I think that's the right thing to, to read. You know, it's just just like how you accidentally wrote a set. I accidentally wrote um this sort of remembrance speech for my grandfather and and it's like part of me thinks it's perfect and, and i don't want to touch it and part of me says maybe i should write something new or fr- and fresh since it happened but something about that pure moment for me was really important like it's like <coughs> you giving a speech is like it's for you like some people feel like when someone dies and you know when you're doing the speeches and you're remembering someone yeah some people feel strongly like this is not the time to be sad. Yeah. And then some people feel strongly like this is not the time for shenanigans. Yeah. Take this seriously. Yeah. And like I'm on the side of like this should be a celebration like as cheesy as it sounds. Yeah. Someone died at work and I did the same thing. Yeah. Interesting. A friend of mine died at work. Yeah. And we had like a memorial thing at work. His family came. His yeah. children came. And I wrote a set about yeah. him. It yeah. Was, it was for him. It was about him. Yeah. And when I saw his wife laughing, yeah, I was I like, "Didn't I just like?" Yeah, I'm trying to. Yeah, I'm trying to understand. Like, yeah, the catharsis of that whole thing is like is is important. Um, it really is. Yeah, I'm with you on that. But if you don't feel like being funny, yeah, do you? No, not at all. I don't, and I don't feel, and I don't feel obligated to. And it's like if if it's not a, if it's in my heart not to be funny for this moment, then it's fine. And you know, it's uh, you know, I think my brother, uh, I think my brother will try to be funny. So there, you know, it's probably like probably try to be funnier than you. And so it's, there's not a there's not like an an estimation. You know what I mean? There's not an anticipation that I need to be. Uh, but then again, that's what I, that's what I'm afraid of. Now I know my sister, my brother, me, and my uncle are all going to give a speech. And the person I want to give the speech to the most is my mother. Yeah, is her father, and she's she's brilliant, and she would totally be funny. Um, but I think it's the same thing. It's like her sadness is such that I don't think she could be funny right now. Um, but I don't know. But yeah. so you know, I, that's that's my concern. Is what what if everybody wrote a heartfelt thing, hoping that I write the funny thing. And then the whole day is tears. You know what I mean? That's that's my concern. Yeah, it's so it's so it's so unfortunate that like that would fall on your shoulders. Yeah. Well, I'm not, and I'm not taking that burn. And then half of me wants to just tell the joke. Um, but that also might not be, you know. So I don't know. I don't know. I won't. Yeah, you know, that's the thing. Is like, you know, as a comedian, we go on our instincts. So it's like I'm not gonna know till I get there. Yeah. And it's like if 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 I leave the wake, I have two days after that. If I leave the wake. Um, and I and I decide that I should write something different than what I feel like I'm gonna say. Then I'll do that. If it's the day of, and I, you know, yeah, and that you know, but it, it, I won't know till the moment. And that's that's kind of what's cool about comedy too. Is is every every new audience is a is an organism, and yeah, and you need to like see the mood. Like I don't know which set I'm gonna do. Yeah, and I do this one. You need to get them. Be like, oh, yeah, it's 
this type of people let me do this. i mean the job is you know and i preach this a lot and especially on this trip the job is basically pick the set be good enough to know what the set should be and do the set stick to the set because your instincts are right but there is a thing about something in the something that happens in the crowd that needs to be addressed needs to be addressed like the other night at um where were we tuesday night and this oh, woman so who kept too. interrupting yeah. yeah and there was something about this woman that we needed to um address we couldn't just leave her alone yeah and so that that became a component of the show for you and for a lot of other guys and that became the funniest thing of the show was was basically you know i don't know what, what was the the gag on her was basically calling her the mother yeah she was people making jokes and when she didn't feel it was an appropriate joke she'll scream out hey i could be your mother i could be your yeah. mother and it's like and then yeah Right, yeah. It does, it's not you're not you're not. Uh, no. And she was a very she was a terrible drunk lady. And I had gotten her to shut up uh, earlier in the show. She came over and yelled at me for being on my phone, and, I, and she said I was being disrespectful. And I was like, Well, I'm going to be on stage soon, and you're talking, which is the most disrespectful. Sitting silently in the corner playing on my phone is not disrespectful. I was also listening because uh, yeah. I have that ability. And then um, and then she was trying to get some of my water, and I said, You can have my water if you don't talk for the rest of the show. And she was successful. Until you you brought her you brought her back out and it was yeah. right before me so I was like I was like this is the worst thing that could have happened so you like you started fucking with her and then uh, Zico came out and he was fucking with her and I was like God damn it I had this lady quiet the whole show like you know sometimes the bad thing is like you don't want to like respond to someone like that and then the rest of the audience like hate you yeah I didn't even finish my sit because yeah. of her oh like, really yeah I didn't oh. even finish my sit because. I said something about her. She was she was dressed like in a school uniform. Yeah, you went in on her. So I made jokes about that. Day. You were crushing on her, and the only problem that I had was I didn't. Sp- the I, and this is the thing, and this is the problem is the the instinct in the U.S. would have been I would love to have her, but here, not knowing the the the, the local language, I don't have the arsenal to compete. Yeah, that was my concern. But you so went in. You were crushing. I said some like st- like very weird things that you wouldn't say to a woman of that age. Yes. And then I was like, oh, guys, is that too much? You see what you made me do? I tried to carry on with my shit. Yeah. But I guess being two years in, the next thing I need to work on is being able to get everyone back on but my I side. Because the, the energy changes. Like, cause you do you think you lost the crowd? I, I lost the crowd. Oh, I didn't realize that happened because I was just like, because I, w- I was kind of in the corner being like, I don't want to have to deal with this. Yeah. So I started just focusing on what I, what I was trying to say because uh, I was going next. But okay, but here's then this was beautiful about a comedy show and other comedians and the recognition and a host. So Zico went up, realized that you died, and then basically just then he shat on you for like five minutes. Yeah. He's like, You can't say these things to a woman, man. You know, yeah, and he basically yeah. like and and you take and you took the, the beating yeah. because you know it's better for the show. Yeah. Um, and that's the beauty of a comedian. Is he knew that he had to beat you up. Yeah. You knew that you had to take that beating for the sake of the rest of the show, yeah. and everybody was fine with that, True. which is beautiful. So, no, I was going to commend you on the fact that like that that you had that 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 much, um, to say balls to yeah to go in after this uh, two years in. But I guess if you lost them, then when halfway I, through when I left, yeah, when I got off stage, I walked past the owner of the the restaurant, mm-hmm. and he sh- and he shook my hand. He was like, you killed. Okay, cool. You was yeah. you was so happy at yeah. what I did. Yeah, but I didn't feel good to me. Yeah, because, yeah, yeah. Because she got to me. Yeah. So the next thing I want to learn, or I want to work on. Yeah. Is like if you did get distracted by something, you know, sometimes you're on stage, the mic goes off. Yeah. Now you have to try your joke again. Now you have to repeat right. the last few sentences that you said. Or you just bail. Yeah, you just skip it. So, whatever the situation, it like, what do you call it? That, that cuts people's attention yeah. for some reason. Yeah. To get them back on into the same momentum of the joke and still go with the joke where you meant to. Yeah. I've seen people after something happened, there was this guy that came up on stage, he started speaking, but the first two sentences that he said wasn't heard by anyone because people were making a noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They took that time to ask someone to Yeah. Please bring me there, please bring me there. So there's so dozens no of ways to handle this. So How did he handle it? So n- so no one heard his first two lines. Yeah. So he said, he started in English. So no one heard his first two English yeah. lines. Then he said, I saw, I saw in his face, he decided to do a different set. Yeah. He started doing a Venex set in Sutu. Yeah. He changed the language, did a new set that something was more comfortable in. Yeah. And he killed. Yeah. And he killed. And I saw he realized, because of those two sentences, the rest of the set won't work. Right. 
Right. He started from over. He scripted what Izzy was going to yeah. do. Yeah. And he started a whole new thing. Right. Because and there's multiple ways to do it, right? So I've seen guys that 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 uh, go up to a rowdy crowd, and then they decide that they have the mic. This is their thing. Like yeah. this is what they're good at, and nobody in this room is going to convince them that they're not good at it. So they just speak slower, and they make the crowd listen, right? Like the, uh, that happened to me. Like the, they they did. Uh, they brought me up. Nobody opened the show. They did five minutes in in Spady. In in Pretoria, in Centurion, yeah. in Pretoria, yeah. uh, the whole show is conducted in Spady. What the uh, Yep Yep show? What I is the name of the gig? I don't know. Uh, I was at Liquid Zone. Oh, okay. And so the whole show is conducted in Spady. And so I go up and I do my most um, complex joke first in English. Okay. Because I need them to pay attention and 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 realize like i don't know there's there's this thing and there's there's a guy in st louis who's really good he's very young but he's very good at this thing where uh he does a setup and then he does a punchline and then he will wait until it is pin silent before he starts his next setup he will make sure every little laugh in the room happens right a lot of us will get the big laugh and then we'll we'll go to the next punchline because we think that they'll accumulate but there's something there's something brilliant about waiting for all of the laughs to trickle down and end because then you get the end of it and then you start a new one and so how would you so like just his persona or his personality he's just he's just confident does. he just stands there and he just and he just stares at them until they're done and then he starts the next one so then he re, he makes the crowd understand that if you listen to what i say you there know. will be a reward at the end yeah. Because what I'm saying is worth your ears. I've I've had people where like I have to stop myself from laughing because this guy's still talking. Yeah. And I know this thing is gonna get funny. Yeah. So I need to stop laughing. I stop laughing. Let's carry on listening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, so a buddy of mine, Andrew Schultz, who's brilliant. Uh, I find that when he would go up to a rowdy crowd, especially you know early on in his career when we all first started realizing how good he was, uh, he would find that the less the the less that the crowd was listening. Um, the slower he would go. So the less he would say, then the more they started to listen. I'm going to try that. Yeah. There's but something I, I, bringing I about it. But it, ta it takes a weird uh, confidence to, to get to that point where you just, you just, you slow it down and you make them listen. Like, I have a, I have a, th I have a, like a 20 second joke. Yeah. Like is it an intro joke or a middle joke or a closing joke? It's usually intro joke. Yeah. I put them in I put it in between jokes. But I know if I start with this joke, people will definitely laugh. Yeah. And people will and after I say that joke, I have confidence because I know they have confidence in yeah. me now. But I also know I need that joke. The the rest of my sit where you have to listen for a bit longer for a punchline. Yeah. I, I don't have that much confidence in it on its own. Right. I know it's funny. I know it's getting there. Yeah. But I know some people might mess it up in between. Yeah. And we were talking about this the other day at the club because we we're talking about if I had to go on after a big guy. Yeah. Or I have to go on right after. Now I know I was I was in this conversation, but I didn't chime in because yeah. what happened was it was my it was my second weekend at Goliath, and it felt like the people in the conversation had some kind of uh, status, and I didn't know, and it, and it was Nina in the conversation. Yeah. And I didn't realize why she was talking at the level she was talking because I don't know who she is, and she does she has status. She's she's the host of one of the biggest shows in this country, yeah. and so she was talking. Coming from that perspective, so I, I felt like I couldn't chime in, but it's go, go, go finish your thought, and then I'll t give you so my like opinion. They were, they were talking about like confidence and whatever, and there was like a whether or not you should follow Luisa Medinga just killed. Should you follow him or should you not follow him? And so, what's yeah. your take? My take was being like a new guy. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get placed in spots where I don't want to. Yeah, and like this is not high school where your teachers asking you. Uh, it's your turn to do your speech. It's your turn to do yeah. your speech, and you don't want to do it. Yeah, we all decided we want to do this. Thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if they say you up first, you're gonna go up first. Yeah, or you going after Trevor Noah, you're gonna go up after yeah. Trevor. What are you gonna do? Right. So I developed this 20 second gags. Like they, they like one liners. One liners yeah. usually get big laughs, and I do that just so the crowd can see that guy was funny, but I'm funny. As I'm well. also funny. I'm also funny. I'm. It's a different thing. I'm. I'm a different guy. Yeah. I'm also funny. 
if you listen now, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so this is what this is what we kind of all decided once once all our friends started getting up at the cellar and they were like put in this position where like they would be going on, but then David Tell would come in or or Jerry Seinfeld would come in and then they'd have to follow Jerry Seinfeld. And then we all kind of like came to this mutual understanding that like there is no better a time in a show to go on than right after Jerry Seinfeld went on. Because A, the 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 palpability in the room is so high. People are so excited about what they just saw. They're so happy about what happened. Yeah. Uh, and then the thing is, they're not going to compare you to Jerry Seinfeld. They're just happy to be involved in comedy. And the fact that you're now on the same stage that Jerry Seinfeld was on gives you another level gives of credibility yeah. that, that you didn't have a second ago. So there is there is this thing that, that that's the best time to go on is right after you know Jerry Seinfeld. Now, now, there's the other side, which is Dave Chappelle will go on and do seven hours. That's the worst time to go on <laughs> after seven hours. But if Jerry Seinfeld comes on, do it. he'll do it. Yeah. But after Jerry Seinfeld comes on and does, you know, a, a regular set, perfect time because the, 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 the level of energy in the room is so high. The, the level of respect in the room is so high. And, and then, yeah, you do that thing. You come on and you do your thing. You reset the room. Uh, Nate Bargatze, another guy I use as an example. Uh, he's like a, he's like a, He's gonna he's gonna be very popular soon. Uh, he's he's like he's hitting the the the, the worldwide threshold soon. Um, yeah. But I was like looking at the fact that I use him as a reference for almost everything. Like he's like like how people use Godfather as a reference point to like explain situations. I use Nate Bargatze jokes. Yeah. So he's got this thing. He's got this mechanism that he does. He's a low energy guy, mm -hmm. but he's very brilliant. And so after somebody that goes on before him that's super famous or like that is high energy, he'll just come on and he'll go, look. The show has peaked and the crowd goes wild and then he's reset the room. He's reset yeah. the room to his energy. Yeah. I feel like the show has peaked and you know what I mean? And everybody knows he's talking about one and line. then he can one line and then he can just do his thing. And we all have that. We have that thing. We have that one line that says to the crowd, this is what I'm doing. And that's why I start my set with with more clear set up punchline jokes, because more likely than not, either the guy before me was crazy doing a lot of crowd work and they're expecting that or the guy before me was crazy doing straight up jokes and so this resets the room that says uh this is the jokes are going to happen and then you know because there's no um you don't need to set somebody up for crowd work you don't need to set somebody up to tell a fun story that's that's the most natural thing there is but you do need to set somebody up and put somebody in a good position to actually listen to the structure of a well-crafted joke so but yeah, crafting a set is is crucial. It's a crucial thing. So yeah. So honor us because yeah. obviously some of us want to do what you did, yeah? Yeah. We want to go to New York, sure. play some of the clubs yeah. here. Maybe get on TV the way you got on TV. Yeah, I got on TV in a week here. In a week. In a week. Maybe we like your voice. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody so said that to me, yeah. So... How much of, of you or how much of your material have you had to adapt to to be funnier or to be understood more? Yet? So now that it's the third week of being here, I added in these couple of jokes. I did the Mopani Worms joke last night where I'm talking about how people are trying to get me to go Mopani Worms. Yeah. I do a joke that I already do that I know works internationally, which is you just it's a joke about it, The joke is about how Tinder is a, is a proximity app. And then I do the thing where I go, well, I did the proximity wrong. And I, all you have to do is pick a town nearby where you, know, where, where you shouldn't hook up with somebody. and You just yeah. say that place. You have to find that place. So I did that one. But the first two weeks, I wasn't comfortable doing doing that so i did those jokes um and then all i had to do was make sure that i knew that dwi is not a thing drunk driving is a thing just these little things and that's that's a very specific one but like or that like you don't have kinkos and fedex so you have like PostNet. so there's yeah. like there's these little pieces in the jokes where they're just little building blocks of the joke that don't matter what, what i found was that the truth of the joke is the same yeah but the the place where you go along the way in the joke the pl you know, like the grocery store, or whatever the place that you go to in the joke that that that, that doesn't really matter but kind of matters. Yeah, just needs to be adapted. Just, it just allows people to see themselves. Yeah. There. Well, th and and it's like saying a specific place brings all of the things that you know about the place to that thing. So I do the joke now where uh, something about the sign, the, you know, the the pooping sign at Spur. And yeah. people know the restaurant Spur. Yeah. And re the Spur restaurant is equivalent to what we have, which is like an Applebee's, which is a restaurant that would be in a mall 
people eat there. The people will tell you that it's good food, but at the end of the day, it's not good food. It's like it's whatever, you know, and it's like, and probably the staff doesn't care that they work there. Yeah, and it's the same place. So bringing so saying Spur brings all of the things with spur that everybody knows to that moment yeah. where you don't have to do any more explanation uh, you know no more explanation so like in your in your twitter joke now and like you'll think you s- you're doing it because you're saying it to africans uh twitter do you know twitter do you know twitter? tinder tinder yeah whatever yeah like you'll ask people do you know yeah. tinder well everywhere and everywhere i go they pretend like they don't know tinder and like sometimes just a thing you're talking to old people yeah because i don't know if Titi told you it's like hey when Americans come here, yeah. they like to ask of, ask us if we know this. Or we oh, know that's this interesting. Whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I gave you the benefit of the doubt on yeah. Tinder because old people don't know. Yeah, sure. A lot of people don't know what yeah. Tinder is. So I, 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 pro- I felt like that joke probably is like that anyway. Yeah, that's the structure of that joke, yeah. So now, what you had to adapt with your style and the material that you have, how much would I have to adapt to... Well, I don't know your whole. I don't know your whole set, right? So you gotta understand. You gotta figure out. Here, I guess here's the here's the thing. If the joke works in Johannesburg and it works in Cape Town and it works in Polokwane and it works in Durban and it works in whatever, then chances are it will work in the U.S. But you gotta understand what the through line is and how universal that is. Yeah. And it it, it is. I mean, it it is a lot of times universal. But it's, okay, so Donovan Goliath has a joke that's very specifically very much about South African gum. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, the end of the joke, and so, you know, so he goes, have you seen the joke? No, he say a few lines on my He goes, he just goes through, like, the level of of wealth that you would have to to chew certain types of gum. And then he talks about how, like, every South African who was poor knows this type of gum, and it was, uh, I don't know, he makes the crowd say it. Okay, cool. Uh, Chappies. Chappies. It's so funny that you know it, too. Um, So we don't have any of that. Right. So he can't come and do that joke. But what's interesting is the through line of the joke is he still ends the joke with. And then people couldn't afford chappies. They figured out that they could take the little piece of gray plastic from the from the Coke bottle and chew on that instead. Now, that's funny. And that's funny universally. But the fact that he's he's hinging the rest of the joke upon the crowd, knowing chappies, knowing the one above chappies, knowing the the, the gum that has Zillatol in it and that people are he's the 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 gag of the of the joke is that uh Guys who have money are buying expensive gum and then breathing on you mm. so that you can smell it and that there's a difference in class in the people that buy gum. Now, universally, that's probably pretty true, but he's going to need to bring the, the names of, the of brands. every pieces of gum. So it's or like so something like list, list gum, sure. same steps and say and sure. leave that blank for people to decide whether they sure, are. Sure, sure. Or, or actually figure it out, right? So it's like, then you got to do the work of changing the words, all the all the gums, or, and figuring out if that really is a soul. And some, some of the things are very in the moment and very very in, in, the, in the community that you're from. I have had the experience where I take a guy from New York City and I drive him to Maryland, we'll play a firehouse gig, and I guess it's the equivalent of playing a village in, in Polokwane, uh, from from the you know from leaving a city to going to a smaller place, yeah. uh, or maybe even playing, playing going to Boxburg, let's say. And what happens is sometimes the th- little things that that you find in your life in New York City, like he was this was a, the one of the one of the guys was a 35 year old guy who wasn't married, and he was just talking about being single and how great it was, and. It was a crowd of married people, and they like didn't get why he was comfortable being single at 35. Because being 35 and being single, where they live, is not funny. I mean, it's the saddest thing there is. What's wrong with you? Right. So I have a friend of mine goes to a church where if you're not married by 25, yeah. So some you got you just got to understand what's universal and what's not. Um, Generally, as a comedian, you should trust your instincts of what's funny. Like I got two jokes that is like not like South Africa specific. I feel like could work in New York. But a lot of my jokes is about colored people in South Africa. Yeah. And it's the only place where you find right. colored people. Right. The rest of the world, it's mixed race, but yeah, this is an actual race yeah. separate from... Yeah, people. and you've created a dynamic here in this country where that is a thing. And people understand what that is. And so you say colored people, and and, and, and what comes with that is all the things that comes with it when you say spur. And you yeah. don't have that in the U.S., so then not having that, you got to figure so out. none of that will work there. Maybe, but maybe. there's probably cultures... Colored people, yeah. Have but you, but, to but your colored people joke might just plug into the difference between white people and black people in the U.S. So you don't know. Probably. You won't know till you get there. Yeah. 
probably Mexicans or any other yeah. of the sure. minorities that yeah. side. Whatever. You got to figure out what the thing is that, that it is and then figure out what the stereotype is. We, we speak in generalities yeah. as comedians. And you just got to figure out what the what the most general version of that thing is so that you can use it to your advantage. Yeah. That's the thing we should explain to people, really, is that when we use stereotypes on stage and people do it and they do races, whatever it is, I, I stay out of the race game. But when you use the stereotypes on stage, all you're doing is you're taking uh, learned information and using it to your advantage. Yeah. And and just because it's you're not using it, necessarily you that came up with that. Well, and it's not, and just because you're using it doesn't mean you that you're uh, um, agreeing to yeah. it. Advocating as a better word. Um, let's let's plug you. We're like an hour in. I feel like this is this is the threshold for people to listen. Uh, hour, tell what? people how to find you on the web. On Instagram and Twitter, I am Emilio Tobias underscore. E-M-I-L-I-O. There's another more famous Emilio Tobias in the country. There's someone else, not in the country. There's <laughs> someone else in the world. They, don't, they haven't posted anything. I think I must report them. I hate that. Yeah. I think apparently, if you report enough people with the similar name to yeah. you, they might consider verifying you. Yeah. Oh, is that how it works? Yeah. If if too many people duplicate your account to try to be you. Oh, so you're just gonna go? This guy's pretending to be me. This guy. I report this thing. This oh, is that's funny. So I can make 25 fake Dan Frigolettes and then get verified. Probably. This is some in how insider information. How many, how many followers do you have? On this None. Thing? Very, very little. Twenty five hundred. No, that's that's a good number. That's not I'm good on like eight hundred and yeah, and ninety. Eight, oh, I like how you know that it's what it <laughs> I is. I want to eat a thousand. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's like my gr- it's like my mom with her. She's she's five foot and a half inch. She needs that half inch. Yeah. You you. She'll it's eight ninety. It, yeah. It's eight ninety. Um. So, yeah. so Emilio Tobias underscore. What about Twitter? Uh, Twitter the same. Emilio Tobias underscore. For consistency. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, check him out. Follow him. Uh, come to South Africa. Not if you're a comedian. If you're a comedian, I'm going to tell every comedian that it was a terrible trip, and that I got uh, malaria because I don't want I don't want American comedians coming here because I I'm going to take over. I want to I want I want this to be my my secret location. Uh, but no, it's fantastic. Everything here is fantastic. Uh, the foods. Fa- I just ate at Grill House. One of the one. Of the, I don't know why I'm shouting them out, but uh, fantastic food. Shout out uh, Goliath Comedy Club. I wore the shirt here today. They took care of me the whole trip. Parker's Comedy Club also took care of me this whole trip. Uh, guys, check us out on iTunes. Check us out on Google Play. Wherever you heard us, we're also on the other thing. Uh, we also have some YouTube content. It just it just died at this exact moment. Uh, so check that out online. We had a fun time here with Emilio Tobias. Guys, thank you so much for listening.